Shalom, shalom, friends. It is great to be here with you. We um, are inviting a small group into the Zoom to live today, and uh, the rest we are inviting into our live stream, which is about to begin, um, so that you can join us for this very important topic. Should diaspora Jews publicly criticize Israel? When, if ever, is it right to, public, to, to publicly criticize? So friends, we're here with a great scholar and great leader. Thank you for being here, Rabbi Gideon Sylvester, who serves as the British United Synagogues Rabbi in Israel. He has taught Jewish approaches to human rights to Israelis studying at the Hebrew University and rabbinic students from the diaspora. Before that, he served as an advisor at the office of the Prime Minister of Israel. He is currently writing his doctorate about settlers involved in religious peace building with Palestinians. His essay on the legitimacy of publicly criticizing Israel appeared in the Feshrift published by Magid Books for Rabbi Sachs, a blessed memory. His essay on the, his essay on the significance of Yom Ha'atzma'ut appeared in the Koran Yom Ha'atzma'ut Yom Yerushalayim Machser. Rav Gideon has written a fortnightly Parsha Tashavua column for the Jerusalem Post and a monthly column for Haaretz.com. He is a frequent contributor to the Judaism page of the Jewish Chronicle. Before making Aliyah, Rav Gideon served as rabbi of Radlet United Synagogue, turning it from the embryonic shul into Britain's fastest growing community. We are thrilled to be here with Rabbi Gideon Sylvester, should diaspora Jews publicly criticize Israel. Please, my friend, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Rav Shmuley. First off, for the invitation uh, for everything that you do, for promoting a Judaism uh, which is moral and ethical. Uh, thank you very much, Eddie, who put together the, some of the technical stuff. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I think I see Professor Daniel Jackson, who is a very old friend, uh, which makes me a bit shy, but really lovely to see you um, and to see everyone. Um, so this is a topic that has been on my mind for many years, um, and I've talked about it in many different constellations as I've swung from right to left to right to centre, um, and it's a really difficult one. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really tricky subject. It's tricky because um, on the one hand, we're aware that there are some people, certainly not everyone, um, but certainly some people in the world who use uh, criticism as, of Israel as a way to manifest anti-Semitism. Um, and on the other hand, we know that there are people who love Israel very, very dearly, um, but are troubled by, by some of the stuff um, that it does. Um, that's probably about half the population of Israel uh, who are critical of whatever its government does um, at any given time. Um, in the rabbinic world, we know that there have been uh, people who have been extremely critical um, of Israel. Uh, one of the most famous uh, was the British chief rabbi, Lord Jakovitz. Um, Lord Jakovitz, at one stage in his career, created, I remember as a child, created an absolute furore um, in Britain, where he made comments in the Evening Standard newspaper, uh, which were interpreted to mean that if Israel could not work out a way to live in peace with its neighbours, then perhaps it, we'd be better off without the Jewish state at all. Um, he argued that he'd been misunderstood, um, and he wrote a book um, to try and explain himself. Uh, the title of the book was based on a pasuk called Luami. Um, in English, it was called If Only My People. Uh, to which my father quipped that he was going to write a sequel uh, called If Only My Chief Rabbis. Um, there was also Rav Amital, uh, my Rosh Hashiva, um, who at times was very, very critical um, of the state of Israel. Um, he, in particular, was the lead voice for saying that there should be a government inquiry into Sabra and Shatila, um, the massacres in Lebanon carried out by the Falange Christians at a time when Israel was responsible for that area. Um, and the OU um, in 2006, I think it was, um, decided that it was going to change its policy from being one of total support for any policy of the government of Israel. Um, after, the, after the evacuation of Altamona, they said they were going to start being critical of Israel where they felt that it was appropriate. So the first thing that I want to say, which I think is very important, is to say uh, that this talk does not come 
Um, either it's not about left criticism of Israel or right criticism of Israel, because the examples that I've given uh, come both from the left and the right. Uh, there are times when both sides have wanted to criticize Israel, do want to criticize Israel um, in very public ways, um, and both have their issues. So this is not about whether right-wing people should criticize Israel or left-wing people should criticize Israel. That's number one. Number two, this has absolutely nothing to do with what we discuss around our Friday night dinner tables. Um, of course, around our Friday night dinner tables, um, if we're not bitching about the rabbis, then we do have to be talking about what's going on in Israel, or we often find ourselves doing so. Um, and I'd rather people talked about what Israel is doing than what the rabbis just done. Um, I have a personal stake in this. Um, so it's not about whether we have freedom of expression or freedom to think or, or freedom to criticize. Um, this is much more about whether we go to newspapers and put in petitions and, um, and make very, very public uh, declarations against Israel. Um, my kind of formative moments with this, and we'll see if I can move the, this is always the scary thing with the PowerPoint. No, it doesn't work. Yes, it does. Oh, that's just a picture of the book in which the article appeared. Um, I have a few formative moments um, in this discussion. The first one comes from my parents. My first memory, one of my first childhood memories, when I was four or five years old, uh, was my father giving me a shower um, and him telling me, Gideon, we're going to have a new au pair. And I want you to look after her and I want you to be kind to her because you must remember that you were once a stranger in the land of Egypt. I did not have a clue about what he was saying. I did not know what he meant, but I did know that he was very serious about it. Um, and it made a huge impression upon me um, to this day. Um, he was saying to me, Gideon, you have to know that you have responsibilities to other people um, and whether they're Jewish or not, uh, those are your responsibilities. The second person who really drilled it into me and changed my life with this, and Daniel will be familiar with this, uh, was my teacher, perhaps you can see him in this picture with Rabbi Sachs, uh, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Levy um, of the Sephardi community. Um, and when I was about six years old, um, I was exactly six years old, uh, I used to go to Cheda, which was the Sunday morning classes uh, for kids who didn't go to Jewish school. Um, and we had lots of very bad lessons in Cheda. Uh, we learned precious little. Um, the classes took place um, in that year in a Catholic school, um, and there was a big crucifix on the wall. And the teacher used to threaten us and say, that's what happened to the last boy who misbehaved in my classes, and we'd all tremble. Um, but one day the rabbi took the class and he gave us a class in which he was trying to explain to us the, the importance of appreciating what we have, um, and the importance of, of thanking God for it. And he started to explain to us um, about poverty in the developing world. And he spoke to us about how many people um, die because of poverty every single day, which is about between 120,000 and 125,000 people um, die of poverty every single day. It made the hugest impression on me. Of all the classes I've ever been in years of great yeshivot, and studying from great professors, no one has ever said anything as important to me as the responsibility to the world, to people who are not Jewish, but to whom we as Jews have responsibility. So that was one side of my education, the importance of, of caring about non-Jews. But the other piece, I guess, which was one of the sort of founding stories on which I grew up as, as a kid, um, was the story of Rabbi Louis Rabinowitz. Um, Rabbi Louis Rabinowitz, some of you may have heard of him. I have a number of his books on my shelves here. Um, he was the chief rabbi of South Africa. Um, he went on to become, I think, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Um, but before all of that, he was a chaplain to the British army during the Second World War. Um, and he was the rabbi of Bayswater Synagogue in London. Um, and you can see him here um, next to that synagogue. Um, and Rabbi Rabinowitz 
famously gave a sermon and people still talk about it to this day. My dad told me about it when I was a kid, but I've heard about it from many others as well. Um, he gave a sermon during the British mandate while the British were taking boats of Jewish immigrants who were landing on the shores of Palestine as it was then um, and sending them off to Cyprus. Um, Holocaust survivors being sent away on, on stinking boats. And he stood up in the synagogue with all of his shiny medals on his chest. And he said, if this is how the British government treats the Jewish people, then I want no part of the honors they've bestowed upon me. And he took his medals and in the midst of his sermon, he spontaneously threw those, those medals down to the floor, um, which for the 1940s was an incredibly dramatic and brave um, gesture. Uh, the truth is, I found out years later that the spontaneous gesture in Shul wasn't quite as spontaneous as everyone thought. Um, and I found that out because um, I was chatting to Abraham Infeld, who some of you may have come across, uh, who told me that actually Rabbi Rabinowitz approached him just before the sermon and said, during my sermon, during my drasha, I'm going to hurl my medals to the floor but I don't want to lose them. So please, would you make a point of crawling across the floor and picking them up um, and keeping them for me so I can have them back at the end of the drasha, which is kind of quite a sweet story from someone who was a little boy then. So we have these two sides to Jewish identity. Jewish identity being about, on the one hand, having very, very, very strong responsibilities to other peoples, um, but also having very, very, very strong responsibilities to our own people um, and to defending our own people when they're under attack. And really, this year is going to be about how we balance those responsibilities. Sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, and the passage, which I think expresses that more than any other, um, is this very famous rumbum in Hilchot Tshuva, you remember that the, the, the Mishnah says that all Jews have a place in the world to come. Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chalek le'olam haba. But the Mishnah goes on and says, except for, and it gives a long list of exceptions of people whom it believes do not get a stake in the world to come. Uh, for the rabbis saying whether or not someone has a stake in the world to come, it's a little bit of like in the game of Monopoly. Go to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass, go, do not peck $200 or pounds or shekels or whatever it might be. Um, for the rabbi saying whether someone has a stake in the world to come is their way of saying whether you're really a part of the game that's going on, whether you're part of the Jewish people. And let's hear what the, what, what the Rambam says. He's listing the exceptions, the people who don't get a share in the world to come. And he says as follows, Haporish midarchid sibbo, someone who separates themselves off from the community. Af al pi shelo avar averot. Even though they don't do a single sin, they're as from as the day is long. They're super from. But, Ela nivdomi edat Yisrael, but in oseh, Mitzvot bichlalam, but they cut themselves off from the Jewish people and they don't do mitzvot together with the Jewish people. And they don't enter the sadness of the Jewish people when the Jewish people are sad. And they don't fast when the Jewish people are fasting. Um, rather, they just go their own sweet way, like one of the non-Jews, as if they're not part of the Jewish people, they have no place in the world to come. In other words, says the Rambam, integral to our religious observance is our connection to the Jewish people. We often think of peoplehood as being a concept which is 
kind of secular. Secular Jews talk about peoplehood. Frum Jews talk about observance um, and mitzvot. But it's clearly not like that at all. The Rambam says central to, to observance is my connection to the people. And if I don't have that connection to the people, it doesn't matter how frum I am. I have completely missed the point um, of the Jewish religion. And we see that extended across halacha, I think most famously in the laws of conversion, because we know that the Gemara in Yavamot says, when a person comes to convert to Judaism, the first question we ask them is, do you want to be part of this people? Um, and only when they've said, yes, I want to be part of the people, despite all their suffering, despite all the difficulties, only then do we start to talk to them about mitzvot. The model, of course, is Ruth. Amech ami belokaich elokai. Your people will be my people, and only then will your God be my God. In other words, central to everything is my identification with the Jewish people. Um, and that identification with the Jewish people means that the religion does not like us speaking badly um, about our people. Um, so we have here uh, a, a, a famous Gemara in Psachim, uh, which is talking about the mysterious beginning of the book of Hoshea. Uh, you remember that at the beginning of the book of Hoshea, uh, the prophet Hosea in English, um, God tells him to take for his wife a prostitute. Um, which seems a very bizarre thing to do. Um, and there's a lot of discussion in the commentators about whether that really happened um, or whether it's simply a metaphor. But either way, it seems to be an, an expression of enormous disappointment um, in the prophet. And the Gemara Psachim says that the reason why God is so hard on Hoshea is because Hoshea has been hard on the Jewish people. And when God turned to Hoshea, you can read it for yourselves, uh, when God turned to Hoshea and said to the, and, and when Hoshea, sorry, turned to, to God and says, your people have sinned, God says, don't talk about my people that way. Don't point out that their faults. That's not your job. Your job is to defend the people. The job of a religious leader, of a religious Jewish leader, before God is to defend them. And we find that theme comes up over and over and over again. Um, it comes up in an agadita about Ishayahu, about Isaiah the prophet, uh, who says, I am a man, when he's called to prophecy, he says, I am a man of unclean lips from an unclean people. And God goes ballistic with him and says, how dare you describe my people um, as an unclean people? We have it in the conversations of, of, of the rabbis. Um, there's, a, there's a beautiful Gemara where Rav Abahu and Reish Lakish, uh, it's in Psachim, uh, in fact, on the, on the same daf, uh, Reish Lakish and Rabbi Abahu are, are walking along. They're on a journey together um, and they decide to stop off on the way, I think in Kisaria. Um, and Rabbi Abahu turns to Reish Lakish and says, are we really gonna stop off in this city um, of sinners, at which point Rish Lakish gets off his donkey, scoops up some sand, and shoves it um, into the mouth of his friend Rebbe Abou and says, that is no way to speak about the Jewish people. Um, and, and this seems to be a theme over and over and over again um, in the Gemara. Don't speak badly um, about God's people. Um, and this theme goes one step further um, in the concept of the Moser, the concept of handing over, not only speaking badly amongst ourselves or in our conversations with God, which is what we've spoken about so far, um, but also speaking badly um, to the non-Jewish world um, and informing to the non-Jewish world um, about the wrongdoings of Jews. Uh, we're going to see that this is more subtle, um, but let's start uh, with the Rambam. Um, the Rambam is again in his listings of 
people who don't get a place uh, in Olam Haba. And here he says, um, hem ha-mosrim. There are two types of people who are called Mosrim. Uh, in Yiddish, they're called voices, people who hand over Jews to the non-Jewish authorities and get them in trouble with them. Someone who hands over their Jewish friend into the hands of the non-Jewish authorities, who will either kill the person um, or strike them. Or says the Rambam, if you hand over either the body or the finances of the Jewish people over to the non-Jewish authorities who are going to um, oppress them, um, then you have no place in Olam Haba. And it struck me that, 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 that this Rambam becomes particularly relevant to us in an age of BDS. In other words, can I speak badly of Israel if it's going to create enormous repercussions for Israel, either physically in terms of the bodies of the Jewish people, our physical existence um, in a world where there are campaigns to uh, stop American support for Israeli defense, um, to stop support for the Iron Dome, uh, which lends protection to the population of Israel, um, or BDS campaigns, which could cripple um, the Israeli economy. And the question is, is it right to do that? And our starting point, but not necessarily our finishing point, is this Rambam, where the Rambam says that handing over Jews uh, all their finances to the non-Jewish authorities is something which is uh, forbidden by Jewish law, not only forbidden by Jewish law, but if you do it, then you are losing your share in the world to come because you have done an act which is so despicable um, that you must be punished for it. Now, when we look at the Gemarot, we're gonna find that there are lots and lots and lots of stories about this. And in the stories, the rabbis clearly struggle. Um, the rabbis see that it's not quite as simple as that, that, that this law presents all sorts of, of ethical dilemmas because what happens when the person who you feel you need to go to the authorities about has really committed a crime or may have committed a crime or may be a danger to society or may be doing something very, very, very wrong. Um, so here's an example from the Gemara in Nida, the Samach Aleph Amud Aleph. Um, and, and it talks about an example where there's a rumor about a murderer or, or a little group of murderers. Um, and they come to Rebbe Tarfon. Ate the Kame de Rebbe Tarfon. Amrule the Tamrin Anamar. They say, please, will you hide us? Um, because otherwise we're going to um, we're going to get killed. Um, and Rebbe Tarfon is really confused about what to do. Amrhu, uh, Hechin Avid. He says, What shall I do? I'm stuck. I lo atmaninan. He says, what should I do? If I don't hide you, you're going to be found um, and you might get killed by the Roman authorities. Um, and the rabbis have said, but on the other hand, it might be that if people have um, if there are rumors floating about about you, uh, there's kind of no smoke without fear, without fire. Um, and I don't want to shelter murderers. I don't want to give protection to people who are doing something fundamentally wrong. Um, and therefore he tells them to go and hide themselves. He kind of finds this kind of awkward compromise um, between on the one hand, potentially uh, shielding people who are murderers, um, and on the other hand, handing them over to the Roman authorities. And there are a string um, of Gemarot on, on a similar theme. Um, there's one about a rabbi who's being 
constantly troubled by, by Biryonim, by these kind of bullies and thugs in the street who are making his life impossible. Um, and he writes to his rabbi and says, what shall I do? Um, I really can't stand this. And his rabbi says, chill out, it'll pass. And then we're told that he writes again and says, it's not passing, it's getting worse. Uh, what shall I do? Um, in that case, uh, his rabbi says, again, you have to hold out, it will get sorted. Um, and in that case, it turns out um, that it is, and the people who are driving him nuts do get arrested um, and taken away by the Roman authorities, and his problem kind of solves itself. Um, we're also told um, about Rebbe Eliezer, the son of Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai, and he's probably the most difficult case. It's a Gemara in Bava Matsya, Daf P. Gimel Amud Bet, um, and he actually volunteers for the Roman police force. Um, he tells the Roman authorities, I know how to catch the criminals, um, and I'm going to work um, as an insider um, to catch the people who are doing wrong. Um, and he does that. He starts handing over people to the Roman authorities. Um, the other rabbis are extremely unhappy uh, with him and with his conduct. Uh, he's the son of the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and they call him uh, vinegar, the son of wine, uh, as something which is, is kind of rotten, um, the son of someone who is very, very great. Um, and eventually the Gemara goes on. It's, it's a long and kind of complex story, which is why I'm not doing it inside with you. Um, but eventually he starts having nightmares himself uh, because he's not sure that he's been doing the right thing. Um, in handing over people to the Roman authorities. Um, and the rabbis come and comfort him. And they say, don't worry, the people who you've been handing over really were criminals um, and you, you shouldn't have sleepless nights over it. Um, but the Gemara kind of leaves us with the feeling that actually the rabbis are saying that because they don't want him to go nuts. Um, they don't want him to totally torment himself. Um, but actually that what he's been doing isn't quite right. Um, so where we're up to on our journey is, first of all, we've had this principle that Jewish people have responsibilities to the non-Jewish world, to the Jewish world, that our responsibility is to identify with our people, to love our people, to care for our people, um, and not to hand over our people into situations where they could get themselves um, into, uh, where they could be betraying their people by either handing over Jewish people or their, or their finances into the hands of, of the non-Jewish world. We saw that even in the times of the Gemara, which I think is, 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 is actually moving and impressive, we find the rabbis actually struggling with this as a moral dilemma. The rabbis aren't quite sure what to do because they understand that sometimes they're dealing with people who've done wrong, just as in the sometimes we will notice that the Israeli government makes mistakes, does things that are wrong. Um, and the question is, what do you do then? Uh, the simple halakha seem to be forbidden to hand people over um, to the non-Jewish authorities, but there is a huge shift um, in rabbinic opinion in the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and that change comes uh, with this figure here, Rabbi Yechiel Michal Epstein, who writes a series of books of halacha called the Aruch HaShulchan. And the Aruch HaShulchan, um, which is an incredibly important halachic work, um, it's up here somewhere, and I've just lost it. Um, yeah, there it is on the top shelf. Um, there's a more modern edition. Um, in the Aruch HaShulchan, he makes a land-breaking um, distinction, um, and it's here. And he expresses it slightly strangely, which we're going to, which we're going to see. Some of his language is certainly not politically correct um, because he's writing in the 19th century. Um, but I think what he says um, and the distinctions that he draws are interesting and, and very important uh, for our subject. Says Rabbi Yechel Mechel Epstein, as is widely known, 
In times of old, in places far away, no person had any assurance in their safety of their life or their money because of the pirates and bandits. And even if they took upon themselves the form of government, so sometimes we had governments that were totally unjust. It is known that this is true even nowadays in some places in Africa where the government itself is grounded in theft and robbery. So says uh, the, the Oracle de Peshul Fund, it's clear that the law of, um, of Moser, the law that I'm forbidden to hand over Jews to the non-Jewish authorities applied throughout medieval times and ancient times where governments didn't run on the principles of justice. But he says, one should remind people of the kingdoms in Europe and particularly our ruler, the Tsar and his predecessors and the kings of England who spread their influence over many lands in order that people shall have confidence in their security and money. The wealthy do not have to hide themselves so that others don't loot and kill them. And his idea is that in a world where essentially there is no justice, in a, in a world where rulers are authoritarian and the law is unjust, then it's forbidden to hand over your fellow Jew to the non-Jewish uh, authorities. But in a world where there is democracy, in a world where there are human rights, in governments that protect our liberties, then it is permitted to hand over a non-Jew, sorry, to hand over your fellow Jewish citizen to uh, the court system, to the police, if you know that they're going to get a fair trial. Um, now, there are questions about what the Aruch HaShulfan really thought, uh, because it's kind of odd, uh, particularly his mention of our wonderful, fair and just Tsar, uh, when we know that the Tsar of Russia was not necessarily known for his wonderful fairness and justice. And some people have used that um, to question what the real intentions of the Aruch HaShulfan were. But nonetheless, this is this Al Hashulchan um, is a really important one in the world of halacha. Um, it's quoted by the Sitz Eli Ezer and, and, and many other halachic authorities um, in terms of uh, the idea that if there are pedophiles, we have to hand them over to the police. Don't say, oh no, we mustn't hand them over to non Jewish authorities. Absolutely not. In a world where there is justice, where there is democracy, you hand over dangerous criminals um, to the authorities. Uh, it's been used in Chuvot regarding kids who joyride. I don't know if Americans have that expression. People who take cars, young teenagers um, who take um, who, who take cars and use them to uh, cars that they shouldn't be driving um, and dangerously drive on the roads. And um, on the basis of this Aruch HaShulchan, Halachic authorities rule, absolutely, you have to hand them over to the police. Um, and I think this al Shulchan becomes very important in terms of how we look at how we relate to treating the state of Israel um, and how we look at the world around us. If we think that the court of public opinion in the world is going to be just and fair, that Israel will get a, a, a fair hearing, then it might make sense to say, well, we should rely on Rabbi Hill Michal Epstein's psak to say that it's okay to protest Israel's behavior to the non-Jewish authorities, to the non-Jewish world, because they will uh, examine the facts and they will decide on the basis of the facts. If, however, we feel that organizations like the United Nations um, the world press, um, public opinion is not necessarily fair in the way that it treats the state of Israel. Um, if we feel that, that there are inbuilt biases, uh, either anti-Semitic or pro-Arab or whatever it might be, that mean that Israel doesn't get a fair hearing, then I think that might influence us to say we should be much more cautious about turning to the non-Jewish world for a critique of Israel. Um, in trying to understand how and when we should be allowed to criticize the state of Israel, um, I turn to, so this is a, a very kitschy um, picture of the Chofetz Chaim, 
um, and his book. Um, but I turn to the Chofetz Chaim. Uh, the Chofetz Chaim, many of you will know, uh, was a great rabbi. Um, I was very privileged uh, to study with one of his students. My teacher, uh, Rabbi Kofnas, uh, was a student in the yeshiva in Radin uh, when the Chofetz Chaim uh, was already an, an elderly man. Um, but he used to describe to me the, the Chofetz Chaim being brought into the Bet Midrash and, and what an incredible privilege it was to study with the Chofetz Chaim. Um, the Chofetz Chaim, of course, his, his real name was Rabbi Yisrael Meir uh, of Radin, but he was known as the Chofetz Chaim because one of his most famous books, and he wrote several very famous books, um, but one of them was his book Chofetz Chaim, which I have um, up on the shelves here. Um, and in his book, Chafetz Chaim, uh, the, the Chafetz Chaim goes through the laws of Lashon Hara. Um, he was the person who really turned uh, Lashon Hara from being um, simply a kind of Musa, ethical, nice thing to do. Uh, he turned it into lots and lots of halachic categories. Um, and he, in his laws of gossip, discusses when one is allowed to share um, gossip. Um, because although in general he feels that it's absolutely forbidden to gossip about other people and what they're doing wrong, there are of course exceptions. The most famous exceptions are um, where you feel that people are going into a business partnership, um, which might be dangerous because one of the partners is crooked. You're allowed and in fact probably um, obliged to warn the other partner. Um, similarly, people going into a marriage, um, if you feel one of the partners um, has some very, very serious and, and dangerous flaws, um, then you may be permitted and even obligated uh, to tell the other person to volunteer that information. Um, there is also a category which the Chofetz Chaim talks about, uh, which is information which is in the public domain. Um, and he says once information is in the public domain, um, it may be permitted to talk about it, um, but he sets up a series of conditions. Um, and what I did was I took his structure, his, his conditions, uh, which really were probably talking more about individuals, um, but I thought maybe we could apply them um, to uh, the Jewish state and talking badly about the Jewish state. Um, and here they are, except I'm afraid they're not very good here. Um, sorry, I copied them onto the slide and it doesn't seem to have come out very well. Um, so I'm going to tell them to you. Um, there's a fuller source sheet, um, which I can give you if you want. Um, so here are his seven conditions, the Chofetz Chaim's seven conditions for when one can speak badly about someone else. The first thing is, Sarich Lirot Be'atzmo you have to have seen the facts for yourself. You can't just rely on other people um, for your information. Um, that becomes, that becomes uh, very important. Sorry. Um, that becomes very important um, in talking about Israel um, because sometimes um, there is misinformation and that really comes into the second condition of the Chofetz Chaim, where he says, You have to look into the incident um, and be careful to see that there is genuine damage and not something that appears like it. Um, that comes up an enormous amount um, in terms of Israel because uh, there are considerable um, number of people spreading misinformation um, and spreading um, manipulative um, portrayals of what goes on in Israel. I can expand on that um, at length, if you wish, in the question um, and answer session. I spent four years working for human rights uh, organizations in Israel, for rabbinic human rights organizations in Israel. Um, and though I saw some very wonderful work, I also saw some extremely dishonest work going on. 
um, and some extremely dishonest portrayals of what was going on, which um, eventually persuaded me uh, that this was not the way forward. So the first thing that the Hofetz Chaim says is you have to check out the facts. You have to be aware of whether these things are true. Next, Tzarich lenasot lahochicham et hamazik, ulai yachzobo v'yashiv et hamazik. You have to go to the person who you think is doing wrong and you have to speak to them about it before you go scuttling off to the world media to criticize them there. You have to have done everything in your power to speak to your local Israeli ambassador, um, to speak to the government of Israel, um, to make your views known internally before you start scuttling off to someone else to tell them uh, everything bad about Israel. Four, you have to make sure that everything that you say is absolutely accurate and there are no embellishments um, which make the incident seem much worse um, than it really was. Um, many of you will remember. Uh, the famous Janin massacre, uh, where Israel was accused of killing hundreds um, of Palestinians, um, and it turned out to be um, an absolute exaggeration and, and almost a fabrication, basically um, a fabrication. We had the same thing um, a few years ago uh, with the accusations that Israel had killed um, hundreds of Palestinians in Gaza. Um, it's something that comes up time and time and time again. So the Chofetz Chaim says, before you start going to the authorities, or before you start going to the press, or before you start um, publicizing bad things about Israel, then you have to make sure that you've got your facts 100% right. Number five, toilet. You have to make sure that your intentions are absolutely to improve the situation, that you have positive intentions. If you are getting any benefit whatsoever out of speaking badly about someone else, then it is absolutely forbidden for you to speak badly about them, even if, all of the other conditions uh, for speaking out are fulfilled. In other words, if you run a human rights organization where you are being paid for your criticism of Israel, where your donors are donating to you because you're writing um, op-eds criticizing Israel and publicizing bad things about Israel, then says the Hofetz Chaim, what you are doing is absolutely wrong um, and you have no right to do it. Um, number six, if you have any other way of correcting the situation um, other than speaking badly about Israel, then that's what you have to do. So if you can find groups in Israel who are doing stuff um, that, that corrects bad situations, that helps bad situations, um, then um, that's what you should be doing rather than going out um, and speaking badly. And number seven is, Im ketotza'ah mehatsipur yigrom lamazik nezek rav yotem ha'ashar ilu bet din hayaposek l'reato gam az asol l'saper. Says the Chofetz Chaim, if by speaking out, you actually create more damage um, and, and do more harm to the person who's doing wrong than any Bet Din would award, um, then that too is forbidden. Um, and I think, again, that, that, that gives us pause for thought. That you have to think about how much damage are you creating for Israel um, in your criticism? What impact can that have politically? What impact can that have on world opinion? Um, and you have to think about whether that impact is, is kind of justified um, by, the, by, the, by the problems um, that have happened. So I think it's, it, it's, it's really important.
important. I think what the Chofetz Chaim gives us is a, a really, really, really important framework um, for thinking about how we speak about Israel, whether we check our facts carefully, whether we make sure that there's no exaggeration, whether we make sure that we're not getting any benefit whatsoever, either financial or in terms of our personal profile, or in terms of the support of our friends um, by speaking badly about Israel uh, before, before we speak and, and whether we can find ways to, to, to improve uh, the situation rather than without being uh, critical and difficult. Um, and I think that those Chofetz claims are, are really, really important. Um, when I stopped working, I mean, I'm going to end with this uh, for the human rights organizations that, that, that send American students to Israel um, and, and um, encourage them to be very, very critical of Israel. Uh, the, the following image came to me um, and, and the image was as follows. It was, imagine one day that you have, God forbid, a fight with your wife, or with your children. And you're in the middle of that occasional, your annual screaming match. You're blessed with a wonderful, happy family, but you have that occasional screaming match in your house. And just as you're in the midst of the row, there's a knock on your front door or the front door bell rings. And someone, you open the front door and there's a young man or woman standing outside and they say, hello, I am your long lost cousin. I've come to stay with you. I come to stay with you because I want to make sure, because I love you so much, that everything that you're doing in your family is right. And I'm going to be taking notes about your relationship with your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife, um, and your children. And I'm going to be sending those reports to social services. And I'm doing all of this because I love you so, so, so much. And you turn to this long lost cousin and you say, long lost cousin, I love you very, very, very much. And I'm really pleased you want to come and stay with me. But is it really necessary to write these reports and send them off to social services? And don't you know that just down the block, there are a whole bunch of wife beaters, child beaters, um, abusers, sexual abusers, people doing all sorts of terrible things wrong. And your long lost cousin says, yes, of course I know that there's all those awful things going on, but I love you. And that's why I'm going to be writing reports to the social services. I suspect that all of us would be a little uncomfortable with that. So I think that it's a really difficult, I think the dilemma that we've been talking about or I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes is a difficult one. I think it's hard. I think we want Israel to be a perfect moral beacon to the world. That's why we exist as a Jewish people and we're passionate about it and we should never lose uh, our, our sense of, of morality and the importance of morals and ethics. Um, on the other hand, there is that question of, is it really the best thing to go out to the world um, and tarnish Israel's reputation. Everything I've said is probably difficult, uh, controversial. Some of you will agree with some, some of you will agree with other bits, some of you will hate it all. Um, and I'm very happy to take your questions. All right, great, Reb Gideon. Thank you for this very thoughtful presentation here. I know we have questions. The first one is from our partner here at Temple Solo, Rabbi John Linden. So uh, Rabbi Sylvester, first of all, uh, this really, really wonderful and a uh, um, just honor to be on with uh, everyone and uh, Rabbi Shmuley for continuing to bring uh, in, important uh, teachers to us. So um, uh, really uh, the question is, uh, Rabbi, uh, an example where you uh, going through and the Chovetz Chaim checklist is really, really fabulous and, and useful. And it feels to me a little bit like, Wow, by the time I go through that, um, you know, it could be six months later and, uh, and I, I need to speak out now. I mean, I, you know, I've, yeah, I've verified that there's truth and I've gone through a number of it. So I'm just curious, um, can you uh, um, 
number one, an example where you have criticized uh, Israel and, uh, and did you go through, you know, these uh, seven, uh, you know, sarich, you know, what's necessary? Uh, and I think, you, I think you understand the spirit of, of the question, Rabbi. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank you for your, for your supportive words um, and, 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 and your thoughtful question. And it's difficult. First of all, we're in really, really, really difficult territory. Um, and the answer to your question, as best as I can answer it on the spot, um, is as follows. I think I, I probably did. Um, I used to write a column for Haaretz every month for Haaretz.com. Um, and if you're a subscriber, you can go back and find them. Um, and in a lot of those columns, um, I was, I tried always to be, to show clearly my passionate love of Israel um, and, and my Zionism, but where I felt that there were things that were wrong in the country, um, I would point them out. Um, and in my work for, by working for human rights organizations was a way of expressing um, my desire to, to letaken things that I, I thought were wrong in the country. Um, the truth is that I feel, I feel I got really badly burnt um, because I saw so much um, that I thought was unfair um, and, and wrong um, in, in the human rights world and so much that I saw that I, I think was unfair. Um, and I kind of feel that I got burned because I feel that I bought into a lot of stuff that I, that I don't think was true um, or fair or justified. Um, and therefore, I, I'm now much more careful. I mean, in fact, I tend generally to stay away from any kind of public statement of, of, of political views. Um, this may have been the furthest I've gone in some time. Um, so I, I, I think we have to be really, really, really careful. Um, I think also we have to remember that, that ultimately, I, I, think a lot of, I think a lot of us behave as if there are 20 or so Jewish states um, and one Arab state, and, and the truth is the opposite. Um, I think Israel desperately, desperately, desperately needs our support. Um, and, and therefore I'm kind of now much more hesitant about criticizing. Thank you. Great question, Rabbi Linder. We see uh, Professor Daniel Jackson has a question here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Gideon. That was a fabulous and inspiring presentation. Thank you, Rabbi Shmuley and all your colleagues for the wonderful work you do. I, I have two questions for you. Um, the first is uh, essentially um, about one of the criteria and the way you elaborated it of the Chafiz Chaim. It seems to me <clears throat> that um, I was very interested by your inference that his, uh, his objection that you couldn't essentially report on a friend if you somehow derived um, benefit from it personally should rule out um, the work of um, NGOs, for example, that benefit in some respect from criticism of uh, Jews or Israel. Um, and, and I have to say that seems very extreme to me. So just to give you one example, um, imagine there's an organization that fights um, for, for Agunot um, and in so doing, in all the battles that they fight and all that they do for women in that precarious situation uh, and in trying to change um, the, the situation that they face and in negotiating with Bate Din and so on, they also happen to publish uh, negative, correct, correct factual information about the state of, of the rabbinate and the treatment of Agunat. Um, it surely would not, it seems to me, it's uh, very demanding to say that such an organization could not raise money on account of awareness of that issue. Um, the second question I had for you, um, I find it fascinating and inspiring that you frame this entire polit political question in terms of personal relationships. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And I love that. But I wonder if in the political realm, um, there are aspects of uh, our relationship to Israel um, which go beyond the personal. Um, sorry, can you elaborate the second question a bit more? Because I'm not sure I fully understood. The, the second question is essentially that, you know, I think what you've done is you've, you've, you cast um, the question of criticism of Israel um, very beautifully and motivatingly uh, in terms of all these traditional texts, all of which concern the relationship between individuals. 
Um, and I think it's a very good lesson for us to be constantly aware of the fact that as Jews, when we criticize Israel, we are criticizing our fellow Jews. But it also raises the question of whether or not engaging in policy debate and being engaged in politics is always a personal issue or whether other considerations might apply. Okay, um, so first, both questions are, are really, really, really good. Um, and I wish I had a bit more time to think about them rather than um, answering them on the spot. Um, I guess, I think, uh, first of all, I think, I think you make a really good point about the Agunot. Um, I, think it, I think probably um, it depends on to what extent your organization is doing lots of other stuff. Um, in other words, if you're an organization that's helping Agunot in 101 different ways, um, and one of them happens to be that you, that, you, that you have to do a certain amount of press activity, um, I think that's probably very different to an organization whose sole role is declarations of criticism. Um, in other words, I also had, when I was working for Israeli human rights organizations, um, I felt much more comfortable um, where they were doing all sorts of really impressive work on the ground um, and, and very moving work going to help Palestinians with their, uh, with their olive crops, uh, harvesting their olives in places where, where it was difficult for them to get to their olives um, and giving them that protection, giving them all sorts of legal protect support, um, employing lawyers in order to help them in the courts. Um, and then here and there, they, they made some pronouncements. Um, I think that's probably very, very different. And I think that would probably be um, the parallel to your Aguna case. Um, I think that's very different to organizations, particularly organizations based abroad, where there's actually no practical help um, or no serious practical help being given in any way um, to help the deal with the conflict here. Um, and all it is is, is people um, writing op-eds which, which create problems um, and, and, and create distress and, and, and possibly have very dangerous effects on the country. So I, th I think that's probably the difference. And I, I think your distinction is a really fair um, and good one. Um, in terms of, of making policy, I, gu I guess it's kind of a difference between, I mean, governments have to make policies, uh, certainly in terms, they have to kind of think broader. Um, one would hope that, that they're thinking broader than just the Hobbit's time. Um, and one would hope that our politicians are thinking more seriously than just the Hobbit's time. Um, although, given some of the events of the last week or so, um, I'm beginning to wonder whether they actually are. Yes, you're right. In terms of big, in terms of, uh, of big policy decisions, you have to think in terms of big policy um, considerations. And there are lots, and they're important. And and yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of individuals or or Jews just trying to do a nice, their good deed for the day, I suspect that the Hofetz Heim becomes um, more significant. Now, Gideon, so I'm going to take the privilege of the last question here. Thank you, Professor Jackson, for that. Uh, actually, I kind of have two philosophical questions. One is, first of all, this has been a very sensitive and very thoughtful way to think about such an issue, so thank you. Um, I, think, I think the primary philosophical lens, although not only, that you're offering is really a utilitarian one. What will the consequence be uh, uh, for me to do this? Not solely, but primarily. And I wonder, through a virtue ethics lens, like who am I as a virtuous person? Like what would a virtuous person do in the face of seeing right and wrong? Like would that lens lend to a different conclusion in any way? Um, and then my second question is, would you give the same advice to Palestinians? Um, which is to say from a Kantian perspective of a categorical imperative, everyone should do the same thing. Would you say if I'm a Palestinian living in Gaza, and I think Hamas is doing something wrong. Again, not making any uh, comparisons between uh, uh, equal, uh, uh, not not not, equi not equivalenting Hamas and the idea and by any means. But I I'm a Palestinian in Gaza, and I think Hamas has done something wrong. Uh, should I speak out against my family? Would you give them some kind of a, a, a similar framework? Okay, <laughs> great question. Uh, great questions. Um, so in terms of the, the Hamas question, I think probably 
Um, the final consideration of the Chafetz Chaim is, is probably a, an important one. Remember that the Chafetz Chaim said that you have to weigh up the, um, the value of your critique and the consequences of your critique um, against the effects on the people that you are criticizing. Um, and, and therefore, I, I think that Chafetz Chaim is really helpful because if you find that you are dealing with a regime which is, um, which is dangerous and um, majorly assaulting human rights, um, and there is huge amounts of suffering happening as a result of that, then it seems to me that the, the, the call to speak out about that um, becomes, there's kind of more reason, there's, a, there's more justification for speaking out against it. And clearly, if it's, uh, if it's, if, if there's huge um, abuse of human rights, um, then certainly you must do that. Um, and I guess the other expression of that, as someone who, who guides in, in Poland and, and possibly in Germany, uh, if you're a German citizen um, in the 1930s or the 1940s, um, should you be speaking about that, about your government? Uh, well, please do. Um, I would certainly beg you to do so. Um, so I think I think your your parallels are interesting. Yes, absolutely. If there are regimes which are evil um, and dangerous, then then you absolutely have to do so. And if the Israeli government ever got to the point where it was um, behaving without moral limits, um, then I guess all of us would have to, and we would have to take to the streets in the same way as I quoted um, at the beginning of the Shi'ur. Um, the um, Rav Amital uh, speaking out against Sabra and Shatila and calling for a government inquiry um, into the behavior of uh, the, the Israeli government because he felt that it had behaved so um, inappropriately. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would definitely, I, I, I think that's the path. There are moments where you definitely do have to speak out whether you're a Jew or a Palestinian. Um, and sorry, you're gonna to have to remind me of the first part of the question. Oh, the first question is whether you think the philosophical lens should primarily be consequential, kind of what the impact will be. And then what about the sort of responsibility of self, like the virtue of, of standing up for what you believe to be right and wrong, regardless of a consequence? Is that, would you factor that in as well? Or do you think it's primarily a consequential lens? Um, I think, I think, and I need to think much more about it. I think, I think, Number one, that, that the study of Torah should be that the process of being a Jew is constantly trying to be a more thoughtful, um, caring and ethical human being and, and sharpening my ethical lens. Um, and I think that that should also be expressed in what I do in Israel. In other words, that should be expressed through or wherever I happen to be. Uh, if, if I'm a Jew in America, that should be through my charitable donations, my, um, my um, volunteering work. In other words, I think there are lots of places where I can express that ethical concern. Um, and then where it comes to criticizing Israel, I, I think there's also room for, the, for those considerations. And I think that's why, um, you know, my approach was quite pragmatic, as you say. You have to see, because if by my criticism, I come out very, I feel very ethical, but what I'm doing is hor has horrible consequences. Well, I, I don't think that turns me into an ethical person. Uh, Sharensky, I think you interviewed Sharensky recently, didn't you? Didn't you do a dialogue with Sharensky? So, so Nathan Sharensky lives on my lives on my neighboring street. He's a member of our street minion. Um, and every Shabbat morning he comes and doubles with us. He's the loveliest man. Um, so he had an expression I once heard him say, it, it's not very politically correct. Um, so you'll forgive me um, or you'll forgive him. Um, but he said you have to criticize Israel as a mother rather than as a mother-in-law. Um, so, um, or relate to Israel as a mother rather than a mother-in-law. In other words, we should have a love for our country. Um, we should be aware of where it goes wrong and help it and support it and correct it, um, but not be looking constantly to find fault with it. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Rabbi Sylvester. <laughs> Very thoughtful stuff to be thinking about here. 
and uh, we thank you for helping us uh, think about how to in, how to engage in such a, a paradigm today, friends. Today at one o'clock Pacific, we're going to learn from Rachel Underweiser on the anti-Semitism on campuses in the U.S. and U.K. Um, that's at, at one o'clock Pacific today. Hope you'll join us for that. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.